Everybody hear me? Can you hear me back there? Everybody? Hello? OK, <clears throat> um, thanks. Just a show of hands, um, who here has heard of software-defined networking? Who here knows anything more than that's what it's called? OK, who here has heard of OpenFlow? All right, that's pretty good. All right, that's, who here heard my software-defined networking talk last year? Oh, OK, that's good. All right. Because I, uh, I, I, I cover a, just a, like four slides of the same material. Um, so this is a bit of actually a, an update from last year where I talked at a very high level about the kinds of things we were investing in. Um, very briefly, Infoblox is a, is a growing public company that sells uh, control and automation solutions to large enterprises and service providers. So um, we don't have any cool, sexy apps or anything. Um, you know, we try to help large companies, uh, mainly in the Fortune 500, get a little bit better efficiency out of their IT staffs as they scale their back-end infrastructure. Um, you could ask, why am I at an Erlang conference? Well, that's a good question. I'm trying to figure that out myself. Um, <clears throat> but, I, you know, as a CTO, I have a suspicion that Erlang and the OTP um, may provide a path for, um, you know, creating efficiencies in large, more traditional mainstream enterprises over time. Um, and so we've been looking at that for the last couple of years. Um, Software-defined networking as a, and I, I won't go into it uh, too much, but as a whole industry trend is at the very highest level um, taking one of the largest kind of budgets in IT, which is the networking budget, which is dominated by hardware, and shifting that to more of a software from a budget perspective. And that's quite a big deal um, in the sense that almost every other industry, including the auto industry, has kind of become software defined over the last 20 years. And the networking industry looks much more like the computing industry in the 70s. So, there's quite a big opportunity there um, if, uh, if to, to add a lot of value to, to organizations. But, in, but it's still very, very early. Um, OK, so in this talk, <clears throat> I'm going to talk briefly about our motivations, briefly about where we've been investing in the last few years around Erlang and the OTP. Um, we have no aspirations of monetizing any of this anytime soon. Um, this doesn't relate to our core products fundamentally in terms of bits today. Um, will it ever? I can't tell you, but we think that the Erlang OTP definitely points the way to properties of systems that we think we would want to build solutions on over time. There's a lot of stuff that we've been investing in that we'd love for more people in the Erlang community to be involved in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that. Um, I'm going to in we have been partnering with both Erlang Solutions and a company called Cloud Dozer. I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Cloud Dozer to talk very specific because, you know, I think you want to get some technical meat out of it, so I made sure I brought someone along and give you some technical meat, and you can get something very concrete out of the kinds of work we're doing. So I wouldn't expect you to walk away with any very deep understanding, but a more of a general idea of where we think the market's going in industrial applications. And I don't mean industrial like oil and gas. I mean kind of mainstream enterprise, uh, uh, that kind of industry, um, and where, th where there may be some holes and gaps going forward. Um, I'm going to go through the material at a lightning pace because not only is there a lot of it, but I just want to give you a landscape. So if there's anything of interest that you want to go deeper, just talk to us afterwards. Um, what do I call it? I call it software-defined networking early in the future of computing because, you know, if you get to speak at the Erlang factory, why not talk about the future of computing? You know, th this is the right place to do that. There's a lot of places you can't do that. <clears throat> so first, the fundamental questions that we've been trying to ask as we see the, um, not only in mobility, but really in how um, manufacturing organizations think about manufacturing, how retail organizations think about retailing, uh, how oil and gas think about digital oil fields, these kind of questions come up like, how do you program the Internet of Things? Because it doesn't, while it's huge, you know, my speech is very buzzword enabled, but we also take some of the trends very seriously. There seems to be a need growing to program the Internet of Things. How do we do that? How do we program a million cores? So many of our customers that aren't Google, which they're not a customer, but you know, aren't Google, aren't Amazon, um, still have or plan to have you know, millions of cores available to do the kinds of jobs that they need to do. That could be in healthcare, that could be in other organizations. So this seems a more pressing question than ever before, 
for the general mainstream uh, enterprise. Of course, if you have that much hardware, it's failing all the time, right? I mean, just statistically, it's just failing all the time. And most of the hardware that our customers buy isn't like, you know, designed to last forever, right? It's relatively commodity hardware. So how do you do that? And of course, you guys already know the answer. Most of the world doesn't know the answer, so you get to be in on the big secret, which is, of course, it's early, right? That's how you know how to program an Internet of Things, a million cores, where everything's failing all the time. All the properties seem to be here in Erlang. I will caution this room, as I always do, that the properties seem to be emerging in Scala, AKKA, and Node.js. And I'll say very briefly that I think Erlang technically is way ahead. I think Scala, AKKA, has the JVM, and the Erlang community should be concerned about that and figure out how to deal with that. And Node.js has a very lot of bright people from Google pushing against it. So even if they get everything wrong, the sheer volume and velocity of what's going on in Node.js may be quite disruptive. So don't take these other efforts. Uh, but I'm a believer. I'm into Erlang, so you don't have to convince me. <clears throat> but if we think about very scalable systems, the Erlang OTP, while it has a lot of things very right, is still, as many of you know, very constrained on the network side. And so we really look at that first, and that's where the software-defined networking came in. Um, there's obviously an answer if you've had any kind of high-performance computing background, that answer is InfiniBand, right? If you want to get great uh, um, performance and kind of properties out of highly uh, scalable clusters, you want to use InfiniBand. Uh, go ask any HPC team. The problem is if you want to actually sell products on InfiniBand, that's not going to work for you because it's too expensive, right? And so one way to think about software-defined networking as it seems to be emerging today out of efforts with, out of Stanford and others, OpenFlow and others, um, is that you could get possibly properties like InfiniBand at a much, much cheaper, more cost-effective way because Ethernet is absolutely pervasive. The story of networking over the last 20 years is not that the Internet's so incredible, which it is, it's that Ethernet won. The world today is an Ethernet fabric. 90% of the ports that Cisco ships are Ethernet. Ethernet's everywhere. So if you had a model to remotely program Ethernet, to remotely program every single Ethernet packet, and by the way, whether it's Wi-Fi, 4G, or actually wired, the software, when it hits a microprocessor, thinks it's Ethernet. The Ethernet frame is a ubiquitous abstraction. So if you had a way to remotely program devices that handled Ethernet packets, that may be fundamentally give you basically Op and open flow is such a thing, that may give you 60 or 70% of the functionality of InfiniBand at a hundredth of the cost. And a cost which, by the way, is dropping. Right? So that's quite exciting uh, if you're starting to think about these things. And if you're not, it's not exciting at all. Um, <clears throat> so open flow, and I won't go big into that, is one way to think about open flow is it's an instruction set for remotely programming Ethernet. So if you imagined in this picture all of these um, green boxes as being hardware Ethernet processing units, like it looked like a switch, but they don't have the intelligence of an Ethernet switch. They don't have any learning. They also don't have the intelligence of other packet processing engines like firewalling or load balancing. They're eight at, when they're put on, they're like a general server. They're ready to process e Ethernet packets, but they don't have any um, semantic behavior before you plug it in and turn it on, and then you remotely connect to it and ask it, each one of these, to start processing flows, which is the flow of traffic from endpoint to endpoint, and they can process those flows at each one of those things in whatever way you want at runtime. So you need an instruction set for that. That's what OpenFlow is. It's the first pass at an instruction set for remotely programming general Ethernet processors. Um, it's the first pass. So I'm not claiming that OpenFlow is going to win uh, or be the, the most important over time, but it certainly is the most mature model for this. And this has been deployed all over the world now. There's lots, if you're interested, there's a whole community. I'm leaving here and going to the Open Networking Foundation, which owns the OpenFlow protocol today. That's very exciting. Um, but that is a fun, I mean, imagine for a second, again, buy, not buying routers, switches, firewalls, and load balancers, which is a classic building blocks of networks, but you buy generic Ethernet processors, and then you remotely program in real time. So you're buying the data plane, we call this the data plane of the network, like you buy servers today. So that's radically disruptive to everything, and it also puts now the focus of attention 
at the control plane, and that's a software problem. So I mentioned before the way the hardware organization was in the computing industry in the 70s, that means that the networking could become generic boxes like Dell sell servers today and an independent software market in networking. That's never happened in the networking industry before. So that's a big deal. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Yes. So are all the data centers like strongly connected? I mean, how do the wires actually connect to the data centers? So how would these connect together? So, um, well, you know, it depends on what your actual, but the model you can have is these are just hooked together with cables. That, the, that actually the, topo the physical topology could be almost random because the logical topology for applications can then be programmed in real time given whatever the physical constraints are. So it's kind of like saying, how is my memory plugged in here? Well, it doesn't really matter. The operating system logically organizes all of the hardware on your laptop for your programs at runtime. You can imagine the same thing here. So there clearly has to still be real um, layer two links, but think about it that way. You just have a layer two mesh that's remotely programmable. Does that make sense? Okay. Any, any questions about that? Okay, so we can talk more about that. There's lots of debates in the world about whether that'll work or not work, whether it looks like asynchronous transfer mode, whether it's gonna fail, blah, blah, blah. We can talk about it. But we think that there's certainly something here, here, right? Um, and so we've been f uh, funding an open source initiative called flowforwarding.org, which is focused on exploring an fully enterprise, you know, an enterprise focused software defined networking stack, 100% in Erlang. I've taken a lot of flack for that, so it'd be nice if you could contribute to it to make it even better. So, you know, it doesn't, uh, it can look like a good idea at the end of the day. Um, we don't know if it's a good idea, but I think that it has serious merit. Um, and I'll go into a little bit why that is. So you can take a look at what we're doing there. Yeah. Is that a rhino? Huh? It's a rhino. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, that's a rhino. That's a rhino, our flow forwarding rhino. Okay, so what we did very briefly is starting in 2012, we actually hired Erlang Solutions to write um, a open flow soft switch, which runs on servers. That's called Link, L-I-N-C. Um, we, we then, and we've kind of made that better. We gave it away for free, it's totally free. And if you wanna hire Erlang Solutions or other companies to modify it, you can. We have no interest in monetizing this. Um, and we didn't write it, so professional Erlang people wrote it. We don't, you know. Um, but we think there's value. We actually hacked up a little application, which if I have time, I'll talk to you about later. All right? And recently, we've been focused on the control plane. So first, we did the open flow switch, which could sit on a server. So imagine 10,000 remotely programmable data plane Ethernet things right? that are not routers and, and, and load balancers, but they're ready to be those things, if so told. Imagine those. That's the switch part or the data plane part. And then the control plane is the thing that tells the data plane to do whatever it's supposed to do with Ethernet packets at real time. So first we focused on the switching part and now um, this year we've been focused more on the control plane, we call that Loom. And then we wrote a little application called Tapestry. If you've heard of Open vSwitch, which is a software-based switch that VMware uh, kind of runs, um, that Link is kind of like that, except it's just focused on OpenFlow. Open vSwitch is focused on a bunch of stuff. Um, it could run on software. This is just focused on OpenFlow. And we're not claiming that it has anywhere near the kind of industrial integrity that Open vSwitch. We're not trying to compete with that, but that's probably the closest thing in the world that looks like Link. Any questions about that? Yes? Is there actually hardware that's just that generic networking yeah. there Yeah. In fact, uh, we'll talk more about it, but just to show you, anything that is basically can run Erlang and has Ethernet ports is such a piece of hardware. So this is a $300 gig, four ports of gigabit Ethernet with Intel Atom processor. This can run Link and become a remotely programmable open flow data path element. They call it, I don't like using the word switch because switch implies kind of learning behavior and stuff and it's really not that, but the general vernacular is a switch. So this would be an open flow switch. You could have a uh, Seacliff Trail is a platform that Intel 
um, sells today. It's 48 ports of 10 gig E line rate programmable ethernet for less than $10,000. Broadcom has a box called the Trident 2 that's like that. And you can just use general servers. And I think Maxim is going to demonstrate the entire behavior on a laptop, right? So. Yeah, the point is that the actual data plane becomes just another computing problem, and you can do it on general computing hardware, and that there's reasonable merchant silicon to de, to de, uh, deframe the frames. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, okay, so just to take it one level down, um, so you can kind of think of it as, well, why would you need this? We think big data is like reasonable application. So again, we wrote this little toy application called Tapestry, which in theory is a big data application. I'm not claiming that we have those numbers today. I'll talk to you about that, though, as an example. And then there's the control plane part, which is Loom. And then there's network. There's any kind of hardware you want, as I just said. And then there's the data path elements, which are Link, right? And so Link is a open flow switch um, on the beam that runs on Linux. And that's what Erlang Solutions wrote. And then Loom, also Erlang Solutions, is, is contributing the first bits to that as well. And yours truly wrote Tapestry, so it's a really terrible piece of Erlang code. So you know, you can send me an email and tell me I should get out of that business fast. But I already know that. That's why we hire other people to do it. Um, now, what we found is that if you're really doing a real networking application, um, link on Beam on Linux is OK, depending on the application. I've let my son watch a Netflix movie through this box, running that code that you can download for free. So, But there are other applications that may have higher latencies requirements or more stiff latency requirements. Um, so we've also been focused on, and this is a big project. Right? I mean, you can imagine this is a big project. So we're trying to focus on the key points. So we uh, hired um, the Cloud Dozer team to help tweak Link, um, and Maxim will talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Ah, on the network boxes of the Erlang. Yes. So this is just a general white box, right? It's running Linux, and Linux running Erlang. So you basically have the Link code, which implements the OpenFlow protocol and allows for Ethernet packet processing, running on a beam, right? Running in a Linux environment. So yes, does that make sense? Yeah. OK, so, but that has a certain kinds of latencies and other things. So actually, Maxim's team has been working on Ling, which is a replacement to the Beam, and Ling on Zen, which is taking Linux out of the equation. So you can basically run the, a Beam-like abstract machine much closer to the hardware, but it's still the same Erlang code. Right? And so they made Link X, which is a, uh, he'll talk more about that, but that's like a faster version. Right? And we just, we're just releasing that now. But conceptually, everything's the same. But one of the points of this is that, wow, look, we're actually making real strides in performance in a software only environment. We're not touching hardware. We're still not doing anything in hardware. We're not doing anything special in hardware. Right? That general techniques to make software run faster on general purpose hardware are going to be applicable here to the point where you know, it just doesn't matter. And that's exciting. Any questions about that? OK. Um, <clears throat> just in the interest of time, I won't bore you with how an open flow switch is uh, organized. Um, this is right out of the open flow specification. So if you go read the open flow specification, it defines that. And it has this picture in it. And I won't bore you with that. But that's what we implemented. This is more focused on Link, which is an Erlang implementation of an open flow switch. Erlang Solutions did a good job of architecting it so you could have different back ends. And Cloud Dozer made such a back end that was closer to the hardware, right? But we were able to reuse all the protocol stuff on top. That's very exciting. And again, these are great things that, believe it or not, in the networking world, it's not always straightforward um, that you can make serious performance gains just by architecting the software right. That's new for networking people, um, lots of networking people. OK, so with, again, in the interest of time with that, um, let me just, you know, last year I talked a little bit about this, but it has been hard to show exciting performance numbers. You know, I can, I can tell you, oh, 
we can kind of do this and kind of do that, but if you had something really you wanted to do, it's not super exciting. I think we're pretty excited about what Cloud Dozer's done with LinkX, so let me turn this over to Max. Okay, this is uh, uh, more like a, a report for, for a stage of the, of, the, of the project we got with, with the Infoblox. So Infoblox uh, asked us to first to demonstrate so that our, our uh, virtual machine, our Lane virtual machine called Lean, is uh, compatible enough uh, to run um, Link switch and other software. And also then uh, we realized so that it, may, it uh, should be worthwhile to try to rewrite a portion of Link switch to make it faster. So that's uh, we kind of uh, mostly complete at this, this stage. There are uh, many other things to, to pursue, but uh, uh, the first results are uh, promising, and so that's, that's what I'm going to share with you now. So that's what, uh, as I said, so that's first we demonstrated. So that's uh, the link switch, which is a pretty, pretty big piece of software. There's lots of dependencies. Uh, um, comprised of lots of applications and s lots of code. And it, uh, it runs on our virtual machine the same way and uh, passes all tests. So that's, that's uh, part one. And uh, the, we were fixing the so-called fast path. So that the portions of the, of the switch which are called for every packet, so it may happen like million times per second. So that's, this is the behavior of those parts are very different from the uh, from things which may not called at all. So, uh, the, so the fast pass, this requires definitely more attention from uh, than when you develop the, such things. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the baseline. So what uh, we, <laughs> I don't know that's if, if, if uh, Stu wanted to show these numbers, but these are, these are real numbers from the, uh, yeah, uh, these are real numbers from uh, the uh, link switch we running the standard backend. Uh, so, uh, so I was, uh, was able to get uh, to, to 200 uh, megabits uh, per second from, from that software. And uh, so that's, uh, well, that may be good for some for some for some applications, but the the bad thing is that this memory consumption was outrageous. It was just ballooning and consuming all the memory. This and uh, so on on Lean, uh, it kind of behaves better because of the so we got a, a slightly different um, uh, garbage collection strategy. And uh, well, I, I guess uh, that the, the beam people may easily tweak uh, tweak beam to to match the, those numbers. So that's that is not not this difference is not uh, that important. So what's important is what uh, what uh, we've done later. So we, we see that what the the, the biggest uh, biggest uh, uh, our concern was this latency inside the switch. Is to 220 uh, microseconds. So this is uh, this is a, a lot of time for um, uh, for processing of a packet. So this is the time then between the then the packet appears on the interface and then uh, until it, it uh, goes goes away. Uh, so this, these are these are the latencies between various elements of the of this setup we, we measured. So and this this looks like a, like a biggest uh, biggest number. So and uh, and it's also a number under our control. So that we attacked that. So what we did is that uh, we implemented a new backend. And the first the first thing that we do is that we implemented uh, flow tables, open flow uh, uh, flow tables. Uh, you may understand what what, what I mean. It's essentially uh, some. It's a uh, matching rules and uh, certain actions which should, uh, should uh, uh, happen if uh, everything matches. So it's so natural to map those matching rules onto, 
on to pattern matching in uh, early end version, but pattern matching. So that the, we uh, did exactly that. So what we, what we are doing, we are taking uh, open flow, uh, open flow rules, and we translate them dynamically into early end code, and then we compile it and reload it using the uh, the famous uh, hot code loading facility of Erlang, and when we just use it to, to, to match packets. So it's um, uh, also um, other things, as a, I don't know what's, if, it, if, it, if it was important, but definitely uh, garbage collection was important. So we're mostly avoiding uh, garbage collection in, on the fast pass. Uh, we also almost never almost never copy data. So the packet arrives as a binary and it leaves as, a, as, a, as the same binary. So it never, never completely parsed into different representation. So we just match it as it is. So we're using all these some binaries and stuff. So we also, uh, I, I paid uh, attention so that I do not create uh, um, stuff in memory just to minimize uh, memory footprints. So that's how you get the, the fastest, uh, the fastest early encode. So this is how, how the, the testing setup uh, looks like. So we got this, uh, this three uh, Zen domains. So the, these two domains, it, uh, they uh, actually four, four Zen domains. This is DOM zero. And these are two uh, two Linux uh, two two domains with Linux, and this is the uh, Linux switch which runs on uh, on LinVM. So th so there, is, there is no Linux in, in in this domain, and they all bridged through the using the Linux bridges. So that's this the setup, and the, what we saw here is that uh, the processing delay was like. 100 times less. So we just, it's a microsecond range. So usually with, you will see the processing of a, of a packet with, within microsecond, microsecond and a half. So it means that uh, potentially the, the, the switch may process a million packets um, per second. That's on a single core using a dynamic garbage collection collected language early. Also, the, the memory consumption was, was uh, much lower, and uh, the, the, the throughput that you could measure with iperf is, uh, was in, in, in the gigabits. And it's the, 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 memory, uh, the, the throughput is definitely constrained now with a, not with Erlang, not with a, uh, you know, lean VM. It, it's all constrained by the Linux bridging in a, in DOM zero. So we will fix that, uh, I guess, in a, uh, later. And we will have even better numbers soon. So that's it. I, I, that's what, what we can do. We, we, we just make uh, make it multi-core, because LinVM is a, is a single-threaded uh, virtual machine. It's different from Beam in that respect. So if you have multi-core machine, you just run many instances of, of lean on, the, on, the, on that machine. So they, we need to figure out how to, to figure out how to this, if this architecture may work for, for lean switch. And also, <coughs> we may fix the bridges. And we may even think about uh, the PCI pass through, just bypassing kernel and everything completely. So this is, the, this is how you make, uh, essentially, Wire speed switch um, in the software. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, the, 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 uh, the beam, the, uh, sorry, the VM that you developed, yep. is it general purpose or is it really targeted towards the uh, this is This is absolutely uh, general purpose. So it's uh, more or less uh, uh, the same, uh, the same uh, thing as beam and uh, we were, th this is not the application we were uh, thinking in the beginning. We're thinking about the just, you know, web servers and, and stuff like that. 
And uh, also, I would like to 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 say it's a, the first time I, I'm saying this in public. So there, there is a decision to make it open source uh, really soon. As a, as soon as I slap licenses on the on the files, so that's that's it. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Could you repeat it? How it compiles? Yeah. So. Uh huh. I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, what? I think yeah, the question is so that was VM versus VM. How would it compare if you actually had real hardware? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Yes, I, uh, I guess um, I'm not the person who can answer that because I'm not a networking guy. I'm, I'm an early guy. No, no, but I think the question was like when you put it to real interfaces like you did today. Oh, uh, yeah. So, uh, so what what we did today is that uh, yeah we we uh, it's not we tested the same thing in a in a not in the VM but in a, in the real hardware again with all these Linux bridges and uh, we saturated one one gigabit interfaces and uh, well we we didn't have uh, bigger interfaces so <laughs> there's no test for that but <laughs> so yeah just to repeat that you can imagine my excitement because. The VM to VM speeds are, you know, um, several times higher than in that case we had gigabit interfaces. But then they they're in shooting distance to get above 10 gig on the inside. So you could imagine now we're within shooting distance. Maybe it's another year or two uh, to get 10 gig, you know, um, line rate on a pure software-based switch, which, by the way, is in a garbage collected dynamic language, which has a functional uh, interface from a programming perspective, right? I mean. If you ever want to sit in a room and see actually something historic happening, you are right now, actually, <laughs> right? And you know, it may take a little while, and we may not be the only group, and we don't care. I mean, we think this is a very fundamental demonstration of what's actually possible in software when it comes to networking. Um, and when you couple that with a very strong model that's been well developed over the last four or five years for programming such a thing remotely with OpenFlow and all the work going on in the controller and control plane and other things, which also lend themselves to Erlang OTP model, right? It starts to get a bit heady, right? So we're quite excited. But again, there's just a lot of, there's still yet a lot to go along the lines. Yes? Well, that's a great, you should ask them, actually. You should present, you should tell them to watch this video and ask them what their reaction is. You know, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. I'm not, you know, I come from a company that sells automation solutions in the networking space, but we don't sell any data plane products. So we're completely on the automation or application level control plane, things like DNS, DHP, things that are like that. So we're not in the data plane business. Um, our customers obviously buy a lot of data plane hardware. I would say at the very high level, um, it seems like the, there is a tremendous savings to be had if all of the rest is there, which we are not claiming that it's there, and we're not, you know, who knows when it's there. It seems inevitable from a market perspective, but the timing seems fuzzy at best. But there seems a huge CapEx opportunity to fund software and create great OpEx uh, gains. And that's exactly what happened in computing in the 70s, right? It was like all hardware, but all computing budgets were hardware focused. And then basically, you know, imagine a company like IBM, they had to compete with both Dell and Microsoft at the same time, because there was an independent software market emerging in the first time in history. That kind of thing seems to be happening in the networking business today. Um, but, you know, again, there's, it could take a long time. There's a lot of market forces. Well, so that's a very question. So the question is, how would you implement BGP? So the first line answer, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, the first line answer is you would implement the semantics for BGP at the control plane le level, and then that would be programmed down via OpenFlow to the switches at real time for the flows that you wanted to behave that way. So one thing, and again, I take you back to InfiniBand, right? The semantics of the actual flows themselves, how packets flow from an application to an application perspective, becomes completely programmed. I mean, the main reason you have standards in the IETF is because 
Hardware vendors had to spin ASICs, so you had to kind of agree on the semantics very tightly. In a software world, we don't have to agree very tightly. So it's not clear that the Internet of Things really is the Internet of Things. In fact, I think IDC suggested it might be called the Interactive Network of Things. Um, so, and you know, even companies like Huawei have been uh, investing quite a bit of research into protocol oblivious um, switching like this. So you can think much more of the, the only real hardware-based abstraction that's important is the Ethernet frame, and then after that it's all software. Right? And for tightly clustered applications, like you might find, and I'll talk about one of them, then you could actually have your own protocols if you wanted, just like you would have if you were programming in Finiban. Right? We don't have to worry. So, uh, but you can also interoperate with all the regular stuff. You can kind of take that offline. Yeah. Say, say that again. How does it fit in the, uh, this is story into the like, OGO and NSB, you know, the open daylight? Oh, okay, okay, so the question is, so there's, there's a couple things going on with the label software-defined networking. Um, how does this story fit into that? And the two things you said are um, kind of network function virtualization, NFV, and open daylight, and I would say also network virtualization, similar to what VMware is doing in NSX. So kind of those three hot spots, and I would say, the open flow style of a fully commoditized Ethernet-based data plane, which is remotely programmable, is well beyond any of those, right? In every sense of the word, right? Like, it's not clear what the market is for that. It's not clear what the initial applications will be. I'll talk about one possible type of application. Um, and it's not clear how the other market forces, you know, what the timing is for other market forces to even allow that to happen. Network function virtualization and network virtualization are kind of on the ground demands for a certain level of efficiency and automation, and you can buy products like VMware's NSX product, or you can think about open daylight as a way of kind of better automating your current hardware-defined network. Right, so I'd say they're kind of paths along the way, but they're a bit paving the cow paths. So when we're pointing at a different kind of future, which is when software trumps hardware for the first time in history in networking, when price and programmability trump performance for the first time in history in networking, and when you can't just pave the cow paths when you sometimes need fundamentally better semantics in your network, then this model seems to be, have a lot of promise. And then when you can program your entire application stack all the way to the ground. Yes. So I went and that's what I, so, so one question is, okay, oh, all right, maybe I'll, I, I was off one slide. So let me go forward and say exactly that. So let's just take, Take a, let's just take a look at kind of the state of the art if we are thinking about programming an entire distributed application. This is why I'm here at the Erlang factory. I believe that the Erlang community is one of the very few communities that understands distributed computing, right, truly and fundamentally. Um, and so one way to think about it is that today, whether it's cloud, private cloud, or embedded systems, what, what you really have are two, are these four kind of fundamental things going on. At the hardware level, you have ridiculously inexpensive, commoditized, ubiquitous network processors and microprocessors. MIPS, ARM, x86, to me they're all the same, right? If you ask hardware people, they're quite different, but let's just, for the sake of software people, they're pretty much the same. As an abstraction, you basically have two fundamental abstractions you can think about software on top of. One is the Ethernet frame. And the other is basically what we now think of as the hypervisor on top of any of these microprocessors, right? So think about Zen, think about the Ethernet frame. Now we've got a very solid foundation for doing an entire stack, because we just demonstrated doing Ethernet packet processing in Zen uh, in real time. And if we were going to make an application like Hadoop, which I think is a nice kind of classic distributed application that happens to be data intensive and needs to move a lot of stuff around. Today, the state of the art is there's a tremendous amount of cruft in the, in the middle. I mean, a lot of complexity. All the operating systems, all the abstract machines, whether it's JVM or Beam or whatever, all the clustering frameworks, all the databases, it's just tremendously challenging to put up what seems actually conceptually is a pretty straightforward application. So I would make the the argument that we're in a very specific time in history because of this ubiquitous hardware, that Ethernet plus multi-core ubiquitously available processors says, look, there's really a new machine available for us to program, right? It's a bunch of cores that are connected by Ethernet. That's exciting. There's a guy in 1984 who worked for Sun Microsystems who said 
the network is the computer, this actually may be the right time for us to think deeply about what that means and how to, how to, uh, how to program such a thing. So one way you could say it is we just need something better at that scalable systems abstraction level, right? We have these are there, the Ethernet frame and Zen. What if we had something that had SDN inside, distributed graph databases, functional languages, looked a lot like Erlang OTP, right? But modernized for ubiquitous and huge number of, of microprocessors and the ubiquitous ability to program Ethernet. And then probably at that scale, everything has to be analytic, right? You're not gonna be able to make a many optimization choices a priori, right? You want analytic processes as kind of deeply embedded into that kind of control plane. But you can imagine writing a Hadoop-like application in a single stack and having it all work, right? You're not, and that's that, you know, even if you get halfway there, it's pretty exciting, right? So we would say this is, um, seems like a big project so maybe that takes 10 years, but that's okay. Um, we'd rather focus on this than some of the other clustering projects going on, frankly. It seems more fundamental. So if you're interested in big, ambitious project, this, we're certainly happy to talk to you about that. And I think we're demonstrating that you know, we're getting there. right? So if you think about Erlang OTP and OpenFlow and Zen, you know, we're starting to see something rough out, like a proof of concept for such a distributed framework. I will tell you again that if you have um, you know, JavaScript engine and a lot of bright people that, you know, this could be done in, Node.js could turn into this, right? Scala AKK could turn into this. So we like Erlang, but, you know, there are no winners. You can't predict the winners. A lot of it will be how much energy, attention, and where the focus is on applications and, you know, there. So what's that, you know? <laughs> like what? So this was a big deal, right? Because now you can say, well, at least, you know, it's definitely possible to monetize Erlang in a very major way. We already knew that already. No disrespect to anybody in the room has made, you know, huge value contributions with Erlang OTP, but this was an attention getter. Um, but I think that this still begs the question, if we had such a system that I talked about earlier, what are the apps? I don't know. If you know, we should talk after the meeting. <laughs> if I did know, I probably wouldn't be just talking to you right now. I'd be doing something else. Um, but I think this is an exciting time to explore the application space. Um, and so I want to talk about one application we wrote on our little proof of concept, right? Um, that is a big data application that's related to networking. Um, and it's called Tapestry. So you can, it's just very simple, not very many lines of code. I wrote them, they're terrible. So if you'd like to rewrite Tapestry and make it cool and good, I'd love that. Uh, won't be offended. Um, but it's a big data application that computes a complexity number um, for your network. And I don't mean your traditional network, I mean your collection of distributed devices that are working together. So, one, so, so what does that mean? And we asked the question, could you even do this? Can you compute a number that's easy to understand and easy to compute that does this? Uh, so we think so. So we created this application that does exactly that. It's called Tapestry, and it actually computes a number we call the Network Complexity Index that rises as the natural complexity of your um, organization's network goes up. That means you're doing more bigger things on your network. So like Google would have the highest NCI in the world, right? And everybody else has an NCI trajecting toward Google's number, right, as they keep going. That's the way to kind of think about it. You can download the paper and read about it. Um, how does it work? So the only reason I put this up here is um, what is because not because of this. I don't want to talk about this specifically. That it's a big data application in the sense that we have to detect communities of things, right? So it's like a graph processing application. So it kind of exercises all the different pieces, and it's getting data in real time from the network itself. So it exercises the entire stack. I won't go fully into that. I'll just say this: the what we're doing here is using. We're just looking for triples by monitoring the recursive DNS layer of an organization um, and finding out which endpoint is talking to one, what other endpoint, right? And that gets a kind of graph, right? And so you can think of just we're collecting a bunch of triples of at this time, this endpoint connected to this endpoint, right? DNS is like a 100% predictor that traffic is going to flow between two endpoints. So you don't have to actually monitor the traffic, you're just monitoring the signaling layer, right? And then we get these huge graphs and then we pump it into an um, a, a, a actual analytic that does um, community detection. We use label propagation method, which you can 
download the code and read. And then we uh, have a very, very simple formula that allows us to find the network complexity index. And I, again, I won't go torture you with this, but basically think of it this way. If you had a Hadoop cluster of like 1,000 nodes, that would be one activity on your network. If you had 10,000 sensors doing something together, that'd be another activity on your network. And the index is basically a balance point between how many activities you have and how many big activities you have. So the more big activities you have, this kind of floater goes up, right? And that's based on a kind of way of thinking about things that uh, came off something called the H index. So you can read about that. So here's how it works, which is pretty interesting. You have DNS recurse, like a large organization, like a large retailer may have tens of thousands of internal DNS recursive servers. I happen to know that because I work for the company that is the largest commercial provider of DNS servers in the world. Um, so it's really true. And, uh, and, but what we do is interesting, which is you have all these recursive DNS servers that have all the endpoints saying, where is this, where is this? We put an open flow switch link in line to the DNS server. So not in line to the endpoint traffic, point to point, but in line here. And then we flow all of that data back into some data center somewhere that's running Loom, not only the control plane for these open flow switches, but actually doing the big data computation on the data itself. So we're doing it all at once. We're controlling how we tap the network, because these are general ethernet processors. So if you had something like a Gigamon, you don't need that. Right? You just have a general server you put in line. We're tapping the network. We're flowing that all the way back up to the data center, doing a clustered large, you know, big data computation, creating the number, and putting the graph out. Um, yeah, so I have all these kind of crazy pictures. One of the reasons I have the crazy pictures is to point out that we don't really think about the physical infrastructure at all. This is kind of all logical but very distributed infrastructure. You have the data center here, which could be running SDN itself as loom scales, and then you have the branch offices that are running open flow switches. So we're really talking about a model of fully distributed computing. Not distributed computing in the sense of just the data center, and not distributed computing in the sense of just the out edge, right? but the whole package. right? And so with one fairly simple software stack, we wrote something that lets us do the whole package. Soup to nuts. And that is kind of exciting. But there's a lot of work to be done. Any questions about that? If there are, we can talk about it after the line, but that's like the fast. But I think the, to kind of conclude, just think about it. If servers equals switches, if these are really, as what we're demonstrating, the same thing, there's no real distinction between a server and a programmable data plane anymore, then that's a picture of John Gage, you know, may, yeah. Maybe, I can only show this at the Erlang factory. This is why I like coming here. You know, maybe we can look past the clouds, right, to the internet of things, right, and really realize that John Gage, the network is the computer, ubiquitous computer. I think we are much, you know, substantially material closer to doing that, and that's super exciting. I, I gave these two slides at the last, at the end of my last talk, which are, there's still huge problems, right? I mean, I give one which is not representing this slide, but if I had 10,000 open flow switches like this, and I wanted to lay down a million open flow rules across 10,000 open flow switches to do some set of applications, I don't want to think about that. That sounds like a compiler problem to me. If open flow is a instruction set for programming Ethernet, you know, we need compilers for that, right? So there's a bunch of stuff, you know, you can't think of, people in the SDN community think about northbound interfaces, that's not gonna work. I don't wanna think about it, I need compilers. Sophisticated compilers that do things like the pattern matching that we saw there need to go there, so, you know, we're just not there yet. So there's lots of work to be done, I'm not claiming this is gonna revolutionize the world tomorrow, but there's a lot of interesting problems to be done. Um, and we just don't even know how to think about it in the abstractions. Um, like the Haskell people say, you know, I.O. is just a side effect, right? Well, that's clearly not the right model for this. So, you know, maybe there is a model where communication is just as fundamental as compute, right? And the Erlang community has been talking about that for a while, but there's no deep theory that suggests that's actually true. So if you have any bright ideas or you're a theoretician, please talk to me after the thing, and that would be interesting. Um, but really, this is a call to action for, I think, one of the most exciting distributed computing communities in the world today, um, and just to show you that you know, you may be like the PC people in 1976. 
It was clear that it was all could happen, right? But it's still a little bit far away. But if you're really focused now in the same way that, say, Microsoft was in the late 70s, there are huge opportunities right over the horizon. Um, and we'd love to certainly work with you and, and get you involved in this organization. Okay, any questions? Okay, thanks.